Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of a Vox by Christina Dolce. So this is a novel in which uh, women only allowed to speak 100 words a day, and if they speak more than that, they get an electric shock. I'm not a woman, so I can ramble on as much as I want, I guess. I was debating actually doing my written review of this in my book blog to keep that to 100 words, um, but the, see, the thing is, is on my book blog, all of my reviews are the number of pages that a book has, so this is like 392 or something, and if I broke that, it would then break all of my statistics because I can easily see how many pages I've read in my lifetime and stuff like that. So I don't want to do that, unfortunately. But it's a good idea, and I would encourage you to do it if you read this book. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. We will not be silenced. Jean McLennan spends her time in almost complete silence, limited to just 100 words a day. Any more, and a thousand volts of electricity will curse through her veins. Now the new government is in power, everything has changed, but only if you're a woman. Almost overnight, bank accounts are frozen, passports are taken away, and 70 million women lose their jobs. Even more terrifyingly, young girls are no longer taught to read or write. For herself, her daughter, and for every woman's silence, Jean will reclaim her voice. This is only the beginning. 100 word limit reached. So, I'd, I would take issue with that blurb in the, the men are affected as well. And I, and I think this is what people don't pick up on like The Handmaid's Tale as much. I guess maybe it, I just see it more like that because I'm a dude, you know? Um, but like, the men have horrible lives in The Handmaid's Tale as well, and in this, okay, they have better lives than the women, but the oppression of women affects everybody, it doesn't just affect women. And I think if we kind of peddle this narrative that, you know, oppressing women only affects the women, which is kind of what this implies, it, I think that's harmful really because then men will be like well it doesn't affect me so what do I care and the whole point is that it does affect men as well you know um, like they're getting brainwashed and all this kind of stuff more so than they are in our current world anyway let's check some shit so um, like the guys they say they know exactly the type of questions to ask closed ended requiring only a nod or a shake of the head and later on she says I could tell them what they want to know about school all men at the front of the classrooms now one way system teachers talk students listen it would cost me 16 words I mean, at the moment, to be fair, you've got one-way systems because of COVID. Teachers talk, students listen. And probably all men at the front of the classrooms because they're probably more likely to misbehave, so you need to put them where you can keep an eye on them. And she says uh, she goes to get a haircut once a month down at Ianucci's. Not that, I've, not that I've changed the cut. I'd need too many precious words to tell Stefano how much to take off here and how much to leave there. And they're not allowed to write either, you know? And actually, there's a reference, which I don't know if I did tab, where there's like a new type of glove that might be coming out to limit hand movements as well. And we get this, um, some days we take the kids to a movie and buy popcorn and soda. Those little rectangular boxes of chocolates with a white non on top. The kind you find only in movie theatres, never in the shops. Sonia always laughs at the cartoons that play while the audience files in. The films are a distraction, the only time I hear female voices unconstrained and unlimited. Actresses are allowed a special dispensation while they're on the job. Their lines, of course, are written by men. I mean, kind of still happens a lot, doesn't it? I quite like this as well, I just thought this was an interesting thought, so it goes. At times like this I think about the other women, Dr. Claudia for instance. Once in her office I asked whether gynaecologists enjoyed sex more than the rest of us, or whether they get lost in the clinical nature of the act. Did they lie back and think, oh, now my vagina is expanding and lengthening, now my clitoris is retracting into its hood, now the first third, but only the first third, of my vaginal walls are contracting at the rate of one pulse every eight tenths of a second. Dr. Claudia withdrew the speculum in one smooth move and said, Actually, when I first started medical school, that's exactly what I did. I couldn't help it. Thank God my partner then was another med student. Otherwise, I think he would have zipped up and walked out and left me laughing hysterically under the sheets. She tapped my knee and removed one foot, then the other from the pink fuzz-covered stirrups. Now I just enjoy it, like everyone else. Then we get this, which I think is another great little line. A lot of these things that I really uh, took away from this book are the ways they kind of show how language is used, you know? So we get, they say you're supposed to talk to plants to make them healthier. If that's true, my garden is moribund. Uh, that's actually a scientific fallacy as well. They've done studies on it, it makes no difference. Another great line, if you want to know what depression looks like, all you need to do is look into a depressed person's eyes. And then um, she has like an outburst and then these cars come and she's worried about what's happening. And another great line here, shit. Three cars means at least three men. Something tells me they're not bearing precious gifts. Not today, not after my backyard performance of last night. There will be a lecture, maybe more than that. Mrs. McClellan, you have the right to remain silent. Okay, lousy joke. So we get this line here, she goes, I don't hate my son, I don't hate my son, I don't hate my son. Except right now, I do a little bit. And this is because the son is sort of bought into a lot of the bullshit, basically. Like, they're being brainwashed at school. So his son's like, we're out of milk. And she's like, well, you could just go to the shops and get some. And he's like, well, no, that's your job. You're the woman. 
which is kind of disturbing as well because it's obviously reflecting a lot of the sexist attitudes that are currently present in our society. Um, we get this two lines which I enjoyed, he says, uh, we get, I bet he quotes from Grey's Anatomy while he's eating you out. I put my notes to the side. The book or the television show? Or both. And then we get this, basically um, gay people are sent to camps, like re-education camps. They lock a dude and a woman together until they get the idea. And um, we get, of course the camps are only a temporary thing until we get on track, in Reverend Carl's words. The camps aren't camps at all, they're prisons. Or they were prisons before the new executive orders on crime were signed. There isn't much need for prisons anymore, which isn't to say there's no crime. There is, but the criminals don't need to be put anywhere, not for long. And we get this, that the Department of Health, uh, the kid, Stephen, who's like 15, he says, uh, Wrong again, Dad. A guy from the Department of Health and Welfare came to our school today. Major assembly. He talked about how next year they're rolling out a new program. Get this. 10,000 books, full college tuition, and a guaranteed government job for anyone who's married by 18. Boys, of course. And another 10,000 for each kid you have. Pretty sweet, huh? It's like sweet for the guys. Yeah, not so much for the girls. And uh, we get a line here. Uh, I recover completely from what women used to call le petit mort. And uh, that means the little death, and it's what used to be a term for uh, orgasms. And so we get uh, this little bit again, a little bit more bit, uh, world building. Officially, premarital and extramarital sex were illegal. They'd always been illegal in most states, a holdover from the days of pre-Middle Ages sodomy laws that forbade even a married couple from engaging in anything other than vaginal intercourse. Immoral and unnatural were the benchmarks. Rarely was anyone charged and criminalised for fellatio or anal play though, and affairs outside the marital bed were regarded as normal, if not commendable, acts. And birth control, that's a good one. The pharmacy shelf that used to hold Trojan and Jorex and Lifestyles boxes is stocked with baby food and diapers, a logical replacement. We get this line, prostitution they say is the oldest profession and you can't kill anything that old. So you know, prostitution becomes kind of, uh, you know, a place where only the wealthy government men can go. I like this little line, between the chows and the kisses and the promises to talk again tomorrow, it takes a full 10 minutes to end the call. If the Italian women had quotas like we do, they'd spend every last word on the goodbye part of a phone conversation. We get this line about MRIs. My friend Joe's recently had an MRI. I had one not too long ago as well because my I had like tension headaches because of my anxiety. It says lying in an MRI tube is like snuggling up next to the ant while Eddie Van Halen wails out a guitar solo. In other words, almost painful. We get a reference to 52 card pickup, which is an old card game. It's like a joke you get taught when you're a kid. I don't know if this carries across to other cultures or whether it's just a UK thing, but 52 card pickup. You get the pack of cards, you throw them in the air, and then you go, there you go, 52 card pickup, because you have to pick them all up. I like this, this line. The old saying goes, keep a stiff upper lip, but as I watch his reflection in the polished steel walls of the elevator, I think that it isn't the upper lip we need to worry about. The bottom one gives our terror away, every single time. Start chapter 58. They say there's no rest for the wicked, so neither of us sleeps tonight. No rest for the wicked is the name of my debut novella, a horror novella. I assume these statistics here are still uh, accurate as well. Approximately 2% of the population holds a doctorate. If you ignore the PhDs in English, the percentage is less. Much less. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention here is the acknowledgements. It says, a man named Stephen King once said, no one writes a long novel alone. I was 10 or so when I first read those words at the beginning of Salem's Lot. They still ring true today. So fellow Stephen King fan. So overall, my thoughts on this book, it was pretty good. The problem is that the concept is probably the best bit of it. The execution was okay, um, uh, so Dolce isn't like the best writer. Um, and here we have a quote on the front, L, a petrifying reimagining of The Handmaid's Tale. And that's really what it feels like. It feels like she sat down to try to write, you know, an updated version of The Handmaid's Tale, rather than to come up with something like unique and original. So I would say in terms of like feminist dystopian literature or whatever, uh, the Power by Naomi Alderman, that to me felt fresh and exciting. This just felt like it was doing the same ideas but 20 years later, you know? So uh, I gave it, I was going to give it a 4 out of 5, but I've dropped it down to a 3.5 out of 5. Especially as well because what I really like to see is the world building and stuff, and we don't really get too much of that here, because it kind of over-focuses on this sort of attempt to escape, I suppose. Um, and what I liked about The Handmaid's Tale was the fact that escape seemed impossible. So yeah. That's what I made of Vox by Christina Dolce. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.